Hey everyone, hey Joe. I'm AI Joe on the tweets. Um, if you follow me on there, you will uh, get uh, first word of new meetups and you get a chance to RSVP before the uh, herd comes running. Um, yeah, so welcome. And uh, let's also uh, welcome uh, the, the Max Kelson crew uh, that are here tonight. And uh, also um, uh, thank IBM for the awesome pizza and the awesome venue. So uh, tonight, uh, the floor is going to belong to uh, Max Kelson Limited. Um, we've got uh, Nick and Samuel and Ethan here tonight, and um, uh, they've, they've got a ton of awesome content. So this is this dropping in and out a little bit? Right, okay. Battery looks okay. I think it's a little bit directional as well. So, okay, I'll try to fit mine. Do you guys have booming voices or? Samuel does. Okay. You're not wrong. Okay, let's see if this is a bit more consistent. So a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, we uh, have uh, bathrooms out here and uh, head out the glass sliding doors and you'll see the, um, the bathroom symbol on your left and just go across the stairwell to the adjacent door um, and uh, uh, the opposite door rather and uh, yeah, you'll be able to find them pretty easily from there. Uh, in the case of an emergency, uh, just calmly follow me out um, and we'll go uh, down the stairwell. Uh, and the only other housekeeping thing is uh, we are on camera. And um, uh, if you guys have questions to ask during the session and afterwards, uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, questions are welcome. Uh, but it's great if you can be uh, holding a mic at the time just so that uh, they can be heard by anyone who wasn't able to be here tonight. Um, is, this, is this really loud now? Should I turn this down a bit or is it okay? It's okay, yep, yeah, cool. Yeah, so IBM is our, is our key sponsor. Um, without them, all this great content wouldn't, wouldn't be possible. And uh, tonight, uh, on our panel, we have uh, uh, Nicholas uh, Thurkelson Terry, is that pronounced uh, correctly? Uh, yep, uh, awesome. Uh, who is the CEO of Max Kelson, and we have Samuel Irvine Casey, who is the uh, uh, Chief Operating Officer. Um, now, these guys are really sought after speakers, uh, talk all around Australia, and they're also real leaders in the AI space, so we're really lucky to have them here tonight. I can't wait to hear from them. and. Um, also, uh, Ethan Mullane, uh, is that the person oh, here? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, on fire tonight. <laughs> um, machine learning engineer. Uh, so um, I'm sure that he will be um, uh, helping us out with the, the more technical questions because there's going to be a real mixture I hear tonight of kind of like business relevant stuff as well as sort of uh, quite, quite a deep look at some AI tech that these guys have been playing with. Um, and then uh, we'll see how much time we've got, maybe a bit of a QA session at the end. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll let these guys um, own the evening. I'm afraid this is going to be the handout mic. That's all right. Oh. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, sweet, awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for having us here in Auckland. Um, Samuel and I have been around here a few times the last couple of months and really love coming over. 
Uh, we noted it's actually closer for us to get here than it is to get to Perth, which is great, because then we don't see West Australians. Um, it's a terrible thing to do. Uh, but no, we're super excited to be here to actually engage in, in what Joe tells us is quite a technical meetup, um, which is really exciting for us. So we've prepared some, I guess, some technical content. Yeah, so the interference can sometimes come from just covering the sites. So um, maybe you just I can't even use a mic. Do you really <laughs> expect me to tell you about it's AI? Very <laughs> yeah. Normally, it's the presentation that stuffs up, and I get to make that joke about Google Slides. But um, tonight, it's the mic. Um, so I, I guess I'll start off with who we are. Um, we're Max Kelson. We're about four years old. We're in a, a company that's based on the idea of taking um, cutting edge machine learning and applying it to business um, or applying it to new problem domains. So we, we have sort of three core um, elements of our business. The first is a consulting business where we spend a lot of time working with businesses to implement uh, machine learning solutions in production um, and help them grow their capability and capacity uh, within the enterprise to actually do more ML, not just with us doing it, but then doing it themselves. We have a product business, so we've spun out a number of products from that process. Um, and finally, we have a research team that's looking into cutting edge AI and applications, particularly in the med tech space, which we're going to get to at the end. Uh, we work with some of Australia's biggest brands, some that you'll see over here, um, financial services, legal sector, retail, government. Um, we work across a whole lot of different areas. We've got about 27 people in our organisation. They range from your standard computer science types over to PhDs in neuroscience and biology. Um, we believe in a really mixed approach um, of skill sets to solving these problems and we think that it's what really helps us have the edge. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on, on who we are. I want to kind of just jump into uh, what we're going to talk about tonight. What we, what we thought would be interesting is to kind of take you through, I guess, over the last three or four years of, of doing this work and working with businesses, we've kind of got to a, a little bit of a framework on, I'm going to show you a little bit, um, but it's just how we define problems and how we find problems in organisations to solve with ML um, and sort of how we kind of explain what it is that we do to business people that might not quite understand exactly what we do and might read too many newspapers and think the chatbots are the be all and end all. Um, we don't build chatbots. I hate chatbots. <laughs> I especially hate them when they're trying to help me fix my flight problems. Um, one particular chatbot. Uh, but then we're going to look at some real world case studies, um, some stuff that we've done for clients that's ended up in real business value, how we did those um, those engagements and the problems that we came up against. I guess to, to frame tonight, one of the things we always find about working with businesses is that you work with real data, real people, real systems, um, and life isn't quite as easy as, as picking up example data sets and building models on top of them. There's a lot of things that you need to do to operate in an enterprise and to operate on real world data that makes life a lot harder than outside the the standard tutorials or, or you know, a lot of the data sets that people are working on. And, and I think what we want to give you tonight is a bit of an idea of how to solve some of those problems when you come up against them um, and some of the approaches that we've used that have been successful. Um, I really want to, I'm personally going to touch on ML in production because I think it's a topic that our field does not talk about enough at all um, and it's really effing difficult. Um, anyone here that's tried, we'll get to that. Um, but sort of best practice patterns and, and how to actually take your models into production and make sure they're going to continue to work over time. Uh, and then we have a bit of a dive into our research if we get to it. Um, we've got some really cool reinforcement learning stuff to talk about um, and a few projects around genomics. So we'll, we'll get to that at the end. But I'll hand over to Samuel for now to talk about our business strategy. G'day. So as Nick said, what, what we wanted to start the talk off with is just identifying a bit of a framework uh, for choosing problems within the organisation or your own side project that is really well suited for machine learning solutions. And this is a quote that has only just come out recently from, uh, he's, a, he's a really, really interesting guy and he's the, uh, the Vice President of Research for Thomson Reuters. We had the pleasure of meeting him over in the States for IBM Think and he and us, we kind of share the same philosophy that we want to use AI to enhance human capability. And especially when you start working for big organizations or with big organizations, you know, 
you don't want to come in and, and try and cut jobs. You're not trying to come in and say that we're going to take something that 30 people do full time and replace it and then just fire them. You know, that, that doesn't work. It doesn't work when we're going with governments or with uh, enterprise. So what we want to do is take those 30 people and have them be more efficient and have them do their job better and more easily. And Nick touched on it as well, but the, the training set is, is a, a fundamental problem when working with enterprise and government. You know, this is not an online course that you start and they just give you a zip file that you then load up and then you spend the entire course just working with it. You know, we find that with our engagements, we spend the majority of our time wrangling data and getting it into a usable state and then we can spend the rest of the time doing the cool stuff. <laughs> it is your life. So this is really you know, the three starting principles that we work with. The human and machine that we touched on earlier. Find problems that you can work with humans to solve, whether that's with domain experts. You know, that's the other thing that we see a lot of, especially in you know, the chatbot space. You know, organizations go to an enterprise and say, build me a chatbot, and then you know, a team of data scientists or computer scientists build a chatbot about the legal sector or about you know, an airline. And what you end up with is something that might be technically okay, but doesn't actually work for the customers of that business. The second thing is small data. And I know that there are lots of organizations, we work with organizations that have billions of data points. But even that is small compared to some of the data sets that researchers are, are training on. You know, we know when we were over in the States, we were talking to people that were running synthetic transaction data for fraud analysis that was in the hundreds of billions of rows. Whereas we work with banks that might get into the hundreds of millions. You know, still a massive amount, but nowhere near what's coming out of these research papers. And as a result, you know, and then many organizations have far less than that. You know, we do you know, work in, in customer um, experience and we get a lot of customer verbatims and sometimes you might get 10,000 responses a year and you're trying to create models that understand what people are saying with really, really small amounts of data. And finally, ethics and explainability. Now, Nick will touch on this later, so I won't uh, say too much on it, but it's something that's really, really important. And I think that people are starting to give it the attention it needs. And I mean, that, that's really important because now that we're getting systems that are making decisions that actually affect people, it's no longer just using machine learning to get insight to the organization, but it might be, you know, the pilots in the US about using ML for bail prediction. Uh, and now suddenly, if you're making a decision about whether someone should go free based on the system, you need to know how the system works. You need to be able to explain it. Otherwise, you know, how do you tell this person that they are, are or are not being granted bail? Then we kind of have a, a bit of a summary of our framework. And this is the sort of thing that we work with an organization through when we're identifying problems to solve. The really, you know, again, I won't dwell too much on this because you can look at it later. But the biggest thing that we see is, can you solve the problem deterministically? You know, we go and talk to organizations and they say, look, the, the thing we need to do is improve our claims automation. You know, we get this one type of claim that if this person rearranges this person, it gets paid out. And it's like, why do you need a machine learning system for that? It's binary. Are they re-rendered? Yes. If so, pay it out. You know, like that's, you know, that's 60% of their claims. And it's like, and so they want to come in, they're like, oh, no, 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 but we want AI. We want AI. And it's like, AI will make this worse. You know, and, and that's like the biggest thing to start with. It's like, can you take a subset of the problem and solve it deterministically? And then once that's done, it might be then, you know, you've solved 40% of the problem, but then the other 60% is incredibly hard and incredibly variable, and that's where you need a machine learning or probabilistic solution. Secondly, is this integral to the actual strategy of the organization? You know, I'm sure this affects a lot of you guys, a lot of you girls, a lot, is that, you know, someone has seen an article somewhere that says you need AI in your business, and they go, yeah, <laughs> I'd like to get some of that AI. But then they go, well, I don't know what this is. So then they go to someone else and go, I need this AI. And then they go to someone else, and then they go to someone else, and then they go to you poor bastards, and they go, we need the AI. And you're like, well, to do what? And I think that that's a big problem, is that then you get these things in, you know, whether it's in strategy or innovation or marketing even, that are like, yeah, we have an AI project, we have an AI team. And then you end up with something that actually doesn't get used. Or there's no plan to get it used. You've got eight weeks of funding to, to get a POC up, and then it's like, you know, move on to bigger and better things. 
So finally then, you know, it's designing an actual program. And this is like adding that third step. Find a problem that works, prove the problem, and then work on how to actually get that into production. And that's something. Yeah, thank you, thank you, sorry. I'm not used to having a mic, I'd rather just yell. It's a terrible mic, I'm not um, <laughs> And Nick can touch on the production side later. So now we wanted to spend some time just jumping into some of the case studies we've been doing and just identifying, I guess, some of the unforeseen challenges, challenges that have appeared along the way. So the first case study we did was with a, uh, a local council of ours. And what they wanted to do was have better insight over the development pipeline in the city. They knew when DAs were being lodged, they knew when they were being approved, but they didn't know when buildings were actually starting construction. And it was a problem that they were previously solving quite manually, whether it was actually like driving around the city and counting uh, the construction sites, or whether it was you know, kind of perusing Google Earth and seeing what, what had happened, but obviously that only updates you know, once a year if that. And uh, they wanted to, yeah, they, that was a big problem for them. And so what we did is we were like, well, you know, this is a relatively easy problem from an image recognition space. You know, as you can see from the images, it's quite easy for humans to work out what stages the buildings are in. So we think it'd be pretty easy for a machine to do that. So we built a rudimentary model. It performed very well. And we were like, great, training set works. You know, we're good to go. Let's start getting some data in and, and see what happens. But the big problem we had that we just hadn't really thought about again from our training set is that we had fed it in images about the lot. Like we had fed it images that were nicely cropped around the lot that we were trying to get. But then when we actually started feeding that data from the mapping provider, we were only able to give a bounding box. We weren't able to give you know, actual coordinates of the polygon. And as a result, you got images like this, where the lot itself is marked in red, but the image we received was the image you see. And the problem then is you've got a model that's quite good at picking up the change, but then you're feeding it multiple different variations and you know, it was throwing some interesting errors. The second issue we had was we started getting weird developments like warehousing, and car parks, stuff that we just hadn't really trained for. And there weren't really that many in the data set. There might've been like one in the last year or two in the last year. But when they popped up in production, they just had no idea how to handle them. So what uh, Appen actually uh, ended up doing was built a pipeline to identify the actual boundaries of the polygon, crop it, and then rotate the image so we could at least provide an image to the model that was you know, far more accurate, consistent, and accurate to the uh, you know, to what it had been trained on. And on the second stage, we kind of started filtering out low confidence images, things like warehouses, things like big parks, and then started reclassifying them and retraining them into their own categories. And one was industrial warehouse, which was one we had to actually end up training its own classifier because it's just it just looked like a construction site because it was just all you know white panel roofs with a few little um, air ducts dotted around. So that's just a bit of an example of the maths behind it. I think the reason why we, just to jump in there, the reason why we chose that example is that it's the dumbest example you've ever seen, right? Like, person has a problem that can be solved by image recognition. Engineer builds image recognition model in like an hour. Um, the, the problem there was that that all seemed really good and the validation set worked and there was an F1 plus like 95, you know, but when you actually push this thing into prod and get real world data coming through and real world requests, all of a sudden the thing goes to shit. Um, because it doesn't come through the way that the engineer expected it to. And there's far more variability in real world data than what's going to come through a training set. So it went from this thing that seemed like the easiest solution ever to solve, something that actually needed quite a bit of math and quite a bit of thought to work out how we were going to solve the various edge cases that that council needed to solve. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things that we find a lot that they're, they're on, you know, prima facie, there's a really easy solution to a problem. Um, but the natural variability of you know, the world means that, though, that there's a whole lot that's still going to be really difficult to solve. Um, and what we find is that council still sends us data sometimes that we're like, what is that? Like, there's a whole golf course that we had to classify the other day that you know, just in the end we were like, well, we'll just do it manually. 
but the you know the, the point is that, and I'm going to touch on this later. But just because you know at, at one point it works in, in the lab or at the experimentation phase, um, constantly checking that model and, and managing its life cycle is paramount. Um, the other thing about that was that really we solved the, the problem ended up being solved with with maths with a deterministic process of rotating and cropping those locks with, with basic mathematics, not with a you know adding extra convolutional layers or extra things to try and get the model to keep up, but actually just by doing some decent software engineering uh, to solve the input problem um, and get that consistent data to classify on. So yeah, we thought we'd start with that, uh, that example and, and move on to, I guess, this is probably our meatiest of the case studies. And I'll pass over to Athen shortly to touch on more of the technical side, but to give you some background around the, the business case, we were working with a major Australian law firm and they're no win, no fee. So what they wanted to do was, they wanted to identify how, you know, what, what variables impacted on factors in a case, whether it was the quantum that was paid, whether it was the time for settlement, whether it was the amount of lawyer hours spent on the case. And what, you know, they, they came to us and said, you know, like, we've just implemented a new data system, new data uh, entry. It's all been great. You know, we're now collecting so many more fields. We've got lots of variables to work from. It should be good to go. Problem was then we had a look at that data and it, it just wasn't good to go. It wasn't, you know, consistent across fields. It was, you know, the quality of the data that had been entered in certain areas just wasn't up to standard. And what we found is that the lawyers were very good at writing down what had happened, but they weren't very good at then entering that into the system. And on top of that, there were actually far richer sources of information in things like medical legal reports, statement of claim, statement of injury, that weren't necessarily you know, able to be put in this nice structured format. And so what we needed to do was overcome those data issues to be able to fill a consistent data frame that we could then build a prediction engine off. And I'll hand over to Athen to tell us about how we did that. Alrighty. Hi. Uh, so I guess when we took on this problem, um, our little group of ML engineers had mostly had experience around working with data from uh, natural, I'd, I'd say natural sources in that it's continuous across space, continuous across time, imagery, natural language, um, and I guess also our experience was, as uh, we already just uh, went over, like at quite a large scale, so uh, it's what most people will get their teeth into an ML um, is large data sets recreating um, academic studies that are usually using you know huge corpses of data. So um, so what we came across with NERV was a fairly limited data set um, across categorical highly cardinal features. So Machine learning models aren't all that fond of categories. Machine learning models like numbers. So um, that's uh, the encoding problem. The, the data is highly sparse, so going back to imputation. Um, and, and of course, our learning uh, solution. So we designed a uh, interesting uh, machine learning pipeline on top of that. So to start with the selection, so yeah, making the most of what was very challenging data. So we um, were provided with a large amount of, well, a large number of features in structured data with maybe 15,000 rows in total, but at the end of the day, once you actually explore how populated that data is, we were seeing fairly concerning results in our, in our sparsity analysis. So what you have um, along the bottom would be each of the features in our uh, structured data and how populated those rows were. And that actually tops out at 11K. So 
I guess what we needed was to find an optimal solution where we were obviously going to have to be doing some kind of imputation where we were using um, data science methodology to fill in some of those unknowns, but also striking a balance where we were getting rid of that data that was just truly awful, going to be way too time consuming from an engineering standpoint. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's finding the right cross section of that data set. So in terms of cleaning and consolidating, um, we, we talked a lot with the subject matter experts uh, on this project and first off uh, was removing the features that were incommensurate with the goals of our prediction model. So I'm not sure if we've specified that but you could imagine um, for this was a, for civil cases, um, uh, we, we use an, a number of metrics to define uh, the success of a case and those might be financial metrics or temporal metrics as well so uh, for, for a civil case what was the uh, quantum that was uh, received from the case or how long did this case run for uh, so that so that was kind of uh, through sub, through discussion with our SME we, we were able to rule out a few there uh, and then just those that were purely uh, looking at on a feature basis, there were some that just there wasn't enough going on there. From there, so we, we uh, as Samuel mentioned, we, we uh, passed out a lot of structured data from things like Medico legal reports and um, uh, statements of loss and damage uh, and, and uh, whatever the, the initial document and you know, um, the schedule of damages when you um, at the outset of the case and so that was actually uh, using um, the uh, natural language API we've since been integrating our own natural language solutions there but that is essentially named entity recognition so we can recognize structure and categories within unstructured courses of text um, and be pulling out named entities. So our uh, analytics and natural language team uh, developed a dictionary of uh, lemmas and uh, corresponding uh, surfaces to build a dictionary for the features that we wanted to engineer out there. So those from the medical legal, uh, you can imagine uh, in, in these kind of cases, things like the severity of an injury is of high concern, uh, the region of an injury, if we can identify that, and uh, the names of parties involved. So it might have been uh, the, medic the medical expert, the uh, defendant for a case, or the, sorry, the, the lawyer's, the defendant's lawyer, or the plaintiff's lawyer. Uh, this is only across um, statewide, so these can actually be valuable pieces of data at this scale. <coughs> So, uh, for, for, for these categorical features, what we had to do was consolidate a lot of them because, um, as I'll give in the, in, as an example in the next slide, you might have a doctor's name that is Dr. John Smith, but that could be, I mean, on the assumption that there was just a single Dr. John Smith in Queensland, which we were seeing overlaps and there were other methods, but you know, there's so many different ways that that might be represented, especially if what you're seeing in the recording of data is free, uh, free text. So we use techniques such as regex, uh, fuzzy matching strategies like the Levenstein distance, which is essentially just a metric of how different any one word is or series of, uh, series of characters is from another series of characters. Uh, Metaphone is quite interesting because it actually looks at the phonetic quality of the word. So that's uh, the example there with Dr. John Smith without a H is that phonetically it may actually sound similar. Uh, for names that's probably of greater concern because you can actually have someone with the name John Smith. So uh, this is what complicates things. If we've got uh, 1100 doctors that we might have found across uh, this corpus of, 
of, of information, there may actually be a John with just a J-O-N. So that's a matter of common sense and, and ideally we'd flag that and there'd be some manual element there. So these are the kind of things that we were just encountering day to day. Obviously the bottom one, I'd probably just chuck it out because there's not enough uh, information there to specify. So further to that, uh, we have imputation. I think I was kind of hungry when I uh, did up these slides. Uh, so there's, there's a couple of food analogies, but obviously the idea is to fill the gaps in the data. So we start with this delicious Gilesburg and end with a, a nice Gouda. Um, so there's a number of ways that you can have a crack at imputing data, and none of them are all that great. Um, obviously the source of data itself is the only source of truth and even then I mean this is business data so it's metrics and things it's not taken from the natural world as, I, as I've already kind of expressed but uh, I, I guess a, a bit of a summary on the things that we had a look at and could have tried and, and did try um, you can use any statistical metric um, and so mean imputation is one that is actually used still quite commonly um, so that would be across, for a given feature, uh, this is assuming you have uh, a numeric of features, you would calculate the mean across the populated values in that feature, and you can fill in the unpopulated values with uh, the, the mean. Uh, the, what we ended up going with was a, a decision tree regression. So. This will actually learn to what degree to bucketize features, and it allowed a lot of adaptability. Um, we will impute the values for every feature, sorry. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, sorry, the imputed values are the mean of the buckets that they fall into, but we were using um, decision tree regression to identify how to define those buckets. What did that optimize for? So that was optimizing for the prediction features. Yes. Yeah. From the only within the training set. Yeah. So uh, when I we say it learns how yep. to factorize features, was it um, did you like train multiple times and like uh, optimize or the best it's called the final model, or was there something that, that this decision tree regression imputation optimizes for internally when it's determining how to fuck things? Um, so the this was uh, at the level of having the um, input features that we were uh, trying to impute data for and knowing the desired output features. Um, so I guess it was a first pass. Uh, at this stage, we hadn't built any complete models, but I guess the goal was to design an imputation strategy based on um, basically mean imputation, but using a bucketization strategy. So it still leans on statistical measures. You're much less likely to overfit, but uh, you can use that strategy to designate the size of the buckets, which is what the decision tree regression is doing and uh, with the supervised features of the, the ones that we uh, had designated from the outset. Yeah. yeah. So it's smarter than using uh, just a, a mean over the entire feature set uh, and learns directly from the data. Uh, the other technique, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, would be to use some kind of like a word vector uh, Oh, sorry, so this is for impu oh, imputation. So, um, actually, ended up with a very interesting connection after this, after uh, talking about this on a previous occasion, with someone in Brisbane who's working on one of the most state of the art solutions to this, which is multiple imputation. So, uh, it's, yeah, very interesting. Um, the idea, obviously, being that if you can uh, use multiple imputation strategies, much the same as you might use. Uh, at a, um, an ensemble uh, model, you can improve results uh, in imputation. So another food analogy. Uh, 
So, as I, as I mentioned, um, for any kind of deep learning model or uh, statistical model, we need some kind of numeric representation. Um, at, if, if, you, if you have the uh, categories of, of fruits, there's no way that you can add or subtract those categorical features from each other. So if we, when working with categorical data, you generally are just going to work with the assumption that these are distinct sets of uh, things and that they're orthogonal in any kind of space that you can imagine. They're not going to, you, you can't do maths with them because they're just categorical features. So, um, again, starting from the, one of the most basic encodings, you could just assign a, new, a numeral uh, and start from arbit uh, some arbitrary position. And uh, if we had uh, the names of people here, mm -hmm. you can assign them numbers. But the immediate problem that arises is Adam plus Alice is not equal to uh, Jian. And um, yeah, that's, I, I guess that's the issue. The, the times when it may work is if you have some kind of ordinality within, uh, within categories and it's kind of your best guess. Um, even then, if you're looking at high school, undergrad and postgrad, is it really reasonable to say, if you were to assign one, two and three to those, is it really reasonable to say that um, high school plus undergrad equals postgrad? So, otherwise, that makes no sense at all. The strategy that is usually favoured and is kind of just the best place to get started with encoding categorical features because it's the only way to encode them as absolutely orthogonal is to use a one-hot encoding where each category within a feature set actually gets its own feature which is a binary feature which is either one or zero. So either, um, so you, you see across the top you have the same number of designated features as there are as categories within that categorical feature and um, each one uh, is lit up if it, if it corresponds to that, uh, that person in the set. So we actually found this really useful because across the large number of categoricals that we had learned, especially in the stuff that we had passed from reports we were getting a lot of overlap across features and that was originally a confronting issue for us. So if we, um, for a given case, there might have been 12 different doctors across you know, an eight month period of a case that we're actually seen to and uh, across the entire uh, document corpus that we may have identified a, a few hundred doctors, but to be able to light up uh, 12 different numbers across the top there is a lot better for sparsity than just having um, a single one and a single zero, and in terms of learning the structure within categorical features, um, it was a pretty good shot. Um, further to that, on, on top of the one, uh, sorry, so one hot encoding actually ended up being our best performing strategy. Uh, impact encoding was another one we explored, which is also kind of falls into the statistical uh, analysis kind of methodologies of um, the the pseudocode is, is there, it's, the idea is to randomize rows, split rows into a number of equally sized folds, calculate the mean of the desired prediction feature, so similar strategy here I suppose, and for, e uh, for each category within the fold and calculate the grand mean of each fold. Uh, this is a much more compact representation of the data, so you end up with one metric per categorical feature and this learns directly. Uh, the other one that we did actually explore was um, using the kind of thing you'd encounter for a word to vector embedding. Uh, that's probably the first thing, if any of you have done any um, word vectorization or anything like that, it'd be the first thing that you think of for categorical features. What we found was, um, as I've said before, for the size of this, for the size of um, this data set, there was too much of an issue of overfitting and for and those kind of deep models were uh, too challenging for, for this data set and so um, the statistical models uh, were found to perform much better. So from an engineering standpoint that's uh, what we landed on. Um, 
I guess the final stage before trying to actually train a model would be normalization. <coughs> so the idea there, uh, this is, uh, the, idea, well, the idea is essentially to standardize the um, spread of the encoded features. So at this point we've got all our features in numerical uh, uh, format, but you would want to standardize those to set the mean at 0, 1, and ideally a standard deviation of 1. Uh, this can be really valuable with working with deep models. Uh, it can halve or even more uh, for training time. Eventually, the hope would be that a, a deep learning model would actually converge without this, but it, uh, it's a much safer bet, and we've found that it, it's it's not really going to do any. It's not really going to harm performance. Uh, same again for linear models, for tree models, which we actually uh, worked with a lot in this case. Um, it's not so much of a concern. So, at the end of the day, um, after all of this cleaning and consolidating, what we had was a, a very nice, cleaned up data set with not a huge number of examples. Uh, I think we had maybe a, a, a final subset of, of 5,000, but from there we had this kind of um, moving horizon of you know what should we where should we cut here and at the end of the day the best performance we were seeing was on only two to three thousand um, examples so with this very limited um, examples and and a large number of features we needed a model that's general enough to explore the space yet focused enough to find the strongest ex ex approaches and exploit their capability so that's the exploration versus exploitation problem uh, which we see a lot uh, in reinforcement learning. First one we had a crack at was H2O. Uh, they have um, designed a very powerful and accessible solution for enterprise. They've also done the world the favor of open sourcing uh, a large portion of their library. And so you uh, are able to access uh, a large number of off-the-shelf models. Uh, and at the time of um, experimentation, AutoML had just been released, which we thought was really cool. So that was um, in open source as well. So, um, yeah, we were, uh, for, for an initial uh, experimentation, this seemed like just about the best possible thing we could have a crack at, um, because this AutoML would throw all of the model combinations described in the previous slide. So um, both deep models and uh, decision tree models um, and uh, whatever the hyperparameters space that's known to work best for those models is. Uh, I was uh, a little disappointed to find out that essentially this is, is just a grid search. So it's a brute force search of every possible combination of model architectures and hyperparameters. So with, um, even with the limited data set we had, this was uh, an exhaustive search and quite time consuming. We were running this for days on end um, on quite powerful cloud compute resources. So um, we arrived at um, a, sorry, our old friend. Our old friend XGBoost, yeah. Um, so there's there's more to it than just XGBoost, um, but we uh, this this um, this architecture has been found to perform really well uh, across um, uh, Kaggle competitions and, and data sets, and um, it's uh, based on um, a Friedman paper from 2016, ensemble of parallel grade boosted decision trees. Um, what we decided to, that's not right, there we go, slide on imputation snuck in there. Um, what we decided to do was set up a genetic algorithm to search the hyperparameter space for XGBoost because we were already seeing good results from the outset with XGBoost. So uh, we had, um, the, well I guess the experiments that we tried were initializing um, an evolutionary algorithm either randomly or with a heuristic. I think we ended up using that heuristic and having 
a hyperparameter space that was evolving over generations. Uh, so we would select the best performing 25% of models of a generation that was, uh, I believe, 20 models was the size of our generations, uh, the size of our gene pool. Uh, 25 uh, randomly generated new models and 50% crossbreeding in from the best in the gene pool and the remainder of the gene pool. And we were seeing what looked to be uh, a convergence after seven to 10 generations. We actually ran this for um, closer to 40 to 50, but we, yeah, we were seeing uh, at least a local convergence within seven to 10 generations. And this was drastically more efficient than the grid search that we were seeing with auto, auto ML. And we were seeing a higher performance uh, using the XGBoost architecture. Have you compared uh, that uh, grid search performance to like a logistic regression based kind of search? Uh, the grid search performance from H2O, the, sorry, the auto ML. Like, I'm just wondering, are you using a genetic algorithm? Is that yep. something that's become a go to for your company based on it being uh, generally more efficient than? Um, trying out like logistic regression based hyperparameter searching or is it just kind of the only one you tried apart from grid search? Um, that, this was the one that we found um, had done really well in, in uh, hyperparameter searches. I guess um, our admission is that we try and tackle these kind of problems top down, don't want to reinvent the wheel and if there's, if there's a proven solution um, from an engineering standpoint in um, a genetic algorithm or an evolutionary algorithm. Um, that's, I guess, what we directed our focus to. Uh, the final, the final slide on this one was to look at Autocaris, which is only about a month old, and this I would regard as the ultimate solution to AutoML, um, or at least for the time being. And this is only uh, well, the open source implementations of this are only about a month old. I think the paper came out of Google Brain sometime in 2016. And um, yeah, AutoKeras is using, it's, it looks a lot like the Keras framework built on top of TensorFlow. Uh, we prefer uh, PyTorch in our current ML stack. So um, ENAS is the efficient neural architecture search. They're essentially, uh, essentially different repo implementations of the same algorithm. But the idea is not just to search on the accessible hyperparameters within a given model, but to actually explore the potential architecture combinations. And this has been proven to outperform the best performing architectures in uh, human designed architectures in both CNNs and RNNs. Uh, and uh, that's an RNN cell. So we're really excited to see this works with RNNs as well. So, uh, do you have? Um uh, options to uh, trade in and out like different like uh, data preparations as well uh, in that pipeline. So ideally, uh, the the I guess the yeah, the imputation strategies and things like that that I discussed would actually be um, fully tunable within the entire pipeline. Uh, we didn't reach that point for uh, this this project, but I think for any kind of um, production pipeline, that's got to be incorporated into it. So you're absolutely right there. Um, at, uh, in the, at the level, well, at the yeah, degree that we took this project, it was a proof of concept, and we didn't incorporate the earlier stage um, feature tuning in terms of uh, feedback from the from the learning system, but I definitely think that's got to be part of it. And yeah. this framework has the flexibility to to make those things effectively searchable. Yes. Yeah. yes. Wow. Yeah. So um, I'll pass question. back. Yep. I'm just backtracked to the genetic algorithm. I'm just wondering what fitness function did you use? So, 
Uh, we just it was the same, uh, yeah, the same fitness function as in the supervised learning. So we were basically, uh, oh, the, so the metric was MAPE, so it was mean absolute percent error, and that's how we were defining performance across the entire supervised model. And we had MAPE over four desired prediction features, so we essentially designed four distinct models, uh, which each one had their own prediction metric. I don't, I think for this, for the, for this one, we're mostly talking about the engineering. Do, do, we haven't, we're not discussing results. Yeah. Discuss results. You can discuss results. Yeah. Well, we're in New Zealand. All right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the results are really interesting, right? So, Samuel touched on before, this is a law firm in no win, no fee. So, basically, if it takes on a case, then it doesn't make enough money out of the quantum or the amount paid to the plaintiff, it doesn't make money. Or if it spends too much time on that case, longer than what it makes out of the quantum, it doesn't make money. So knowing, being able to predict A, the quantum that's going to be paid at the end of the case, and B, the amount of lawyer hours that can be spent on the case, is fundamental to this firm's profitability. Right? So you would think that lawyers that do this day in, day out, are pretty good at picking whether they're going to make money on a case. It's kind of their job. Uh, pro tip, they're real shit at it. Um, they, they have a, a mean absolute percentage error of somewhere between 90 and 100% on each of those metrics. They are way out. Uh, our proof of concept ended up coming in around 10 to 12% average across those two, higher on one, lower on the other, correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, so substantially lower than where the lawyers are at. Uh, this means two things, and I think if we, if we rewind to this being a, an idea on business, this actually means two things to the law firm. It means A, they solve their initial problem that they can better pick which cases to take on and be more confident about their profitability. But B, it means that lawyers don't need to look at the case before they know if it's going to be profitable. So we can actually automate a whole lot of lawyer hours which they don't ever make any money on, working out whether that case is going to be profitable, and also do a better job of working out if it's going to be profitable. So they get a double win in this. The, the kind of road to production is then to put this on, in a web format and have you know, prospective plaintiffs upload their documents and just be able to do it without any human touch. So there's, there are a range of benefits to the business of implementing something like this. Um, I think there's a, there's a bit of work to go before it's production ready, um, but it, the, the initial results are extremely promising. Um, and, and because of, you know, as, as Arthur touched on, because of the, the limited amount of training data, uh, it did end up being a, a shallow learning approach. It, it ended up being a GBoost that, you know, that worked best for us. We tried a, a heap of, of, of deep neural network architectures um, but they are suited to certain situations and I think it's really important as a, as a data scientist to understand the whole suite of tools in your toolbox and not immediately jump to DNNs um, on any, any problem because in some problems they're just not the right tool. Um, you know, you've, you've, got to, you've got to test the different architectures available to you and try a whole lot of different things to try and work out whether you know, you're going to achieve the ultimate goal. So I think uh, in the interest of time, we might uh, skip this last case study. Um, essentially, what we were doing was um, designing a prediction engine for uh, EV games uh, around next um, purchase. If you're interested in that, there were some interesting challenges around you know, how do you prevent it, just recommending Call of Duty to everyone, and also you know, how do you deal with sequential-based prediction, right? Like I might play only FIFA every year on PC, but then I've just gone out and bought a Wii U and Mario Odyssey. So it's like, you know, are you going to recommend me FIFA for the PC or are you going to recommend me something for the Wii U? And I think that's a, a really interesting challenge that we um, had to overcome. But yeah, if, if you're interested in that particular case study, uh, we can talk about it afterwards. But what we wanted to, I guess, finish on, and uh, I'll hand back over to Nick, is talking a bit about how to move that into production. And finally, we'll then finish up on uh, a bit of our research. Um, just a pro tip on that one, that we ended up using an events-based um, LSTM model to predict next purchase, and it was extremely effective um, for what they were looking at. But the takeaway is collaborative filtering was cool in the early 2000s, but it's now you know, super rudimentary technique. If you've got enough data, understand uh, next purchase in, you know, in, Temporally, um, and, and understand the arc of purchases, and it's, you'll, you'll get much better predictions. Um, I've shamelessly stolen this slide off a Google presentation at Next um, a few weeks ago. Uh, it's because it's true. 
Um, anyone that has tried to do ML at serious grade production, it's fucking hard. Uh, it's real hard. And it, it is not a solved problem. And even you know the conversations that we've had with top engineers in, in Google and IBM and all sorts of the biggest tech companies in the world agree. Um, and like I, I think I touched on it right at the start, this is something that particularly in Australia we do not find people talking about a lot. Um, but if you build something that's really, really cool, it's got to end up in prod. Uh, and you've got to understand how to get it there. So I, I have like four things that I'm touching on today. There are like 50 that I'd like to, and I could probably do this all night, but I've just chosen some key ones that I, that I think are interesting at the moment. Um, the first is life cycle management. Um, your model has a life cycle. If you build it today and it's F1 is 93, Chances are tomorrow it's F1 will be 92. Chances are the day after that it'll be 91. Chances are in a year it's completely useless. Um, and if you just take your model and deploy it, there, there, is, there are two rules. The first is your model is most accurate in experimentation and it will lose accuracy the minute you go to production. The second rule is your model will lose accuracy over time, period. Right, so you've got to consider those things when you're moving into prod. And that means you need a proper understanding of life cycle management. And I'm going to touch on, um, I'm going to touch on workflow management really quickly in a minute. Um, but pro tip data scientists, Jupyter Notebooks are not a workflow management tool. <laughs> After. <laughs> um, <laughs> They, they, they are very, very good for experimentation. They are very, very bad for production. If anyone's read that Netflix paper that's just come out on Medium, ignore it, they're full of shit. Um, <laughs> it's not a good idea. You really need to understand what needs to be done to move this into production. And you don't want to be retraining that model every week, right? That, you don't want that to be your job. You want to go build new models, which means your model needs to be able to retrain itself every week. So this is a paper that's come out of, this is actually out of the um, TFX paper, the TensorFlow Extended Framework paper, which is really, really awesome. Everyone should read it. I'm going to touch a little bit on it in a sec. But it, it basically gives this sort of framework. It, this isn't perfect and it won't suit everything. But the idea that you need to be able to go from ingestion to analysis to validation of the data, not of the model, then into transformation, then into training, then into model evaluation, finally into serving and you need to continuously monitor every inference that that model, ma that, that model makes, right? And that needs to be a feedback loop that is set to a cadence that makes sense for the model. It's a good idea to look at your model's um, validation scores over time by doing manual validation to understand how long it takes for your model to become worse. YouTube, for example, found that their recommendation models dropped by over a percent every hour. Therefore, they had to retrain every hour. That's now, they're shorter than that now, but that was three or four years ago that they were retraining every single hour. Other models need to be retrained once every six months because they are in relatively slow moving environments that don't change that much. But by understanding the cadence, you can, you can set a proper lifecycle management tool um, to, to really manage that, right? Um, I've got a note there, just. When in doubt, it's the data, stupid. Um, it always comes back to data, which leads me to my second point, um, data validation. Now, one thing that frustrates me about ML engineers, running a company of software engineers and ML engineers, is software engineers are really, really good at tests. ML engineers are really, really bad at tests um, because they think that a validation score is a test and it's not. Um, so the first thing is to understand that the software programmers, uh, like software systems are defined by code, right? They're defined by rules in code. And therefore we can write unit tests to test whether they perform. For ML systems, it's actually not defined by the code. The code is just a way of manipulating the model, programming the, the APIs. It's actually defined by the data that you feed into it, right? So one of the most important phases of validation needs to happen at the data phase, not necessarily at the, the model phase. Um, so this is where TensorFlow Extended comes in. If you haven't read the paper, I strongly recommend it or at least have a look at one of the summary um, talks that Google gave after they released it. But they, they propose a framework for doing validation on data on the way into that retraining cycle. Um, and they do a really, really good job. So they've got some questions there which I, I like. Um, how, do they, how do you connect your data? Um, you know, what shape is my data and are there any errors in my data? And that's the last bit you've got to be asking. 
are there errors in my data? Is my data wrong? Um, it comes back to our point way, way back at the start that real world data is a lot of the time wrong. Um, they have a choice quote here which I really like. They want um, data scientists to treat data errors with the same rigor and care um, that software engineers deal with bugs in code. Uh, and I, I think that's a really important takeaway. You need to think about data like it's your code. Um, because it is the thing that is going to define the performance of your model. <coughs> Next thing I want to touch on is bias. Um, has anyone seen this paper? Because I won't go over it if you're all across it. This is the this came out oh NIPS last year or just before NIPS last year. Um, it's so the first uh, just to frame this. I've got a um, a quote here by an app report member, which doesn't mean anything to you, but it's Australia's um, banking. Uh, regulatory agency, so it oversees everything that banks do. We do a lot of work with banks. Um, and Jeff Summerhays, being an old grey man that doesn't know anything about computers, basically says to the banks, um, don't you dare use artificial intelligence to make decisions about your customers, right? You can read between the lines, that's what he's saying. We don't understand it, so we don't want it. Um, it's really important for the industry to build trust in what we're doing and, and to show that we understand the inherent problems with some of the things we do. And one of those, one of those really major concerns is going to be bias. Um, and this paper, I think, really hammered it home to almost everyone that read it because it's the stupidest thing ever. Uh, a, a Stanford grad, she looked at error rates in um, facial recognition APIs from Google and IBM and. How many IBMers are in the room? Anyway, um, the you know, and all every every sort of facial recognition API um, that's that's publicly available. And what she found was that if you're white and male and middle aged and look like you're from Silicon Valley, they perform really really well and have a really low error rate. If you're white and female and look like you also might live in Silicon Valley, then you have a slightly better or well, worse error rate. Um, but if you're darker in female, then your error rate might be 35%. Um, to put that in context, the white male error rate is 2%. It's, it's not great. I mean, this is the easiest thing we do, right? Whenever anyone wants to show some AI, some ML tech, they'll pull up a little image recognition thing and go, I can guess your, you know, your age and your gender. Um, and even that has a, a, a racial and, and gender stereotype bias in it. Um, and it's not that anyone sat in Silicon Valley and went, I'm a white male and I hate dark females, so I'm going to make a shit model that guesses their age wrong. Um, that's not what anyone thought, but no one asked the question, is my data set representative? Is the error normally distributed? Or do I have a bias problem? Um, and what's, I think what's really, really important for us to do is to start asking those questions. Um, whenever we're dealing with new data, to ask the questions, is this data bias? Could it be? Um, what could be in there? What questions can we ask? So IBM, on the good side, uh, released a really great paper earlier in the year uh, for a pre-processing package uh, to look for biases that exist in data. They reduced their um, image rec error rates to, I think they got the, the darker females down to 3.4%. Um, so a tenfold increase on what it was before, just with pre-processing. So no new data, just pre-processing better, reducing the bias that's inherent in the data set, and they got a far better model out. Um, so that, that's going to be huge. The other side is explainability. So we've all heard GDPR, it's around, everyone's scared, shitless of it. Um, the, the important thing about GDPR is it does have a right that any decision made by a human must be explainable to the person to which it was made. Uh, it's really hard, particularly if you have a recurrent neural network. Um, really hard. We, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, this is going to, something that's going to come up a lot. Um, a lot, and, and the bigger models we build, the deeper our ensembles, the more layers, the hidden layers that we put into our models, the harder this is. So we're kind of running away in the wrong direction. Um, we've got to come as a group, as a as a industry, to a point that we can explain our models, even if that isn't explaining the mechanisms within the model. Right? If I explain human decision making, I don't explain the neurons that fire in your brain. I explain the circumstances within which you made the decision. I might think about the life experiences that you've had that have led you to that decision. And I ask myself the question is, was that decision rational, rational on the facts that you had in front of you? Um, and that might be the sort of explainability that we're looking for uh, in, in ML. There's, there's some argument out there that if I have to explain a workplace injury, I don't need to that involves something falling off a 
scaffolding. I don't need to explain gravity, right? It's a, it's a given. Let's 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 move on. Let's understand the circumstances that that event happened in and why it happened and whether it could have been avoided. Um, there's other legal opinion a, a, about whether the intention of the creator of the algorithm might be held liable in a, in, you know, when some of these things go wrong. So there's a lot to think about here, and I just want to I just want to put this out as caution. That if you are working with algorithms that affect people's lives, you know, if you're making a credit decision about something, if you're making a parole decision, if you're making a, a decision that has a, a material impact on someone's life, there is legal liability to that decision being made incorrectly. And there probably is a way that they will ask for explanation. So you've got to ask, what's the context within which I'm making the decision? Um, and then work out the risk factors of, of available. And, and if it is a high risk area, probably think about an explainability strategy early on, um, just so that you've got it. Explainability strategies can also be really, really good for debugging the models, um, because they can help you understand when they make bad decisions. So they're not all esoteric and, and legalistic. So uh, the, the last bit I wanted to touch on here is some good news. We are finally seeing some convergence in model hosting um, frameworks. TFSERV, for anyone that's used it, knows that it's the worst thing in history. Onyx is unusable. Cap2 is interesting, but it's not that great. Um, there's been a lot of horses running in this race and really no convergence on, on good serving um, architectures. Obviously, now Amazon have SageMaker and IBM Watson have Watson Studio and they all want your compute and they want it forever. Um, so I, I'd encourage you to have a look at Kubeflow, um, which is an open source project set around Kubernetes. Um, it supports PyTorch, TensorFlow, a bunch of other algorithms. It natively hosts them in pods in Kubernetes and is a really awesome tool for hosting multiple models. Argo is a workflow management tool, which is great for lifecycle management, um, for doing all your data work. It, it spins up to every stage in a, in a process. It spins up a new pod. Um, it, it, it's logging is excellent, um, and again, it's, it's cloud native, but cloud agnostic, so it's architected in Kubernetes, so you can move it to wherever you want to put your compute. Um, and, and these are sort of where we're seeing Google fall behind and a range of other major players in this space are falling behind this sort of open source stack. So if you are struggling with hosting models and getting workflows into the cloud, I definitely suggest having a check out of these projects. So research, um, we said at the start that we engaging in research and we, we do have a strong research focus in our organization. We want to make sure that whilst we're working for business to solve real problems, we're continuing to, to push the boat forward um, in a range of areas. And Apple's going to touch on our research in reinforcement learning shortly, um, but I wanted to touch on a, a few little things. I guess, I guess our focus, because we can't do everything, right? Um, as much as we'd love to, because we're super geeks. Um, so our areas of interest are really reinforcement learning, um, autoencoder architectures, natural language processing, because that ties into one of our products, um, healthcare, which we think is, is huge and there's, there's massive opportunity there, um, and how that ties into precision medicine and genomics, um, and finally quantum computing, which we're not going to get into today. Well, you really forced yourselves to narrow that down, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now a wish. Now a <laughs> Brain computer interfaces is coming next. Yeah. So it's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, so this is sort of our, I guess, our flagship project in our research team. Um, I'm going to fly through this as quickly as I can. Um, who here knows a lot about cancer treatments and new cancer treatments? Any people? One. Awesome. Um, so really, we're looking, we're looking at immunotherapy. So immunotherapies are a new cancer treatment. Um, they've been around a little while, uh, but they're becoming more mainstream at the moment. But essentially, at a very simple level, um, they help the body's immune system attack cancer, which it is not good at doing, normally it doesn't see it as, as um, you know, malicious and therefore lets it grow, right? Immunotherapies can be extremely, extremely effective. Um, if you have stage 4 melanoma, um, the previous diagnosis was that you're screwed. Um, now if you happen to respond to the immuno that you're on, you, you might be bought a lot of time um, with relatively little side effects, if none, depending on, on who you are. Um, but the, really the problem around this is the response rate is low. We don't know who is going to respond to an immunotherapy. Um, we don't know which immunotherapy they're going to respond to. So basically at the moment it, it, it works out if you've got stage 4 melanoma, finger in the air, um, can you afford one of the new drugs or will you take the PBS drug, um, off you go, we'll see what happens. 
DocTivo is on our pharmaceutical benefits scheme in Australia, so it has been accepted into the PBS. Um, but it costs about $150,000 um, for a single patient for a single year. It's incredibly expensive for the taxpayer. Uh, and we only get about 33% response rate on that drug. So that means 77% or 67% of people um, might have been able to have a better drug than what they were given. Um, and also, we just spent a whole lot of money that we didn't need to, right? And actually, the problem with immunotherapies is when they go wrong, they can go catastrophically wrong and the, Im the immune system can attack the host, um, which gives you a far less dignified death than had you written out your stage 4 melanoma. So, what we really want to be able to know is whether you're going to respond or not. Uh, so, we've attracted a circa $10 million of funding from a range of bodies, including the Beijing Genome Institute, um, the Royal Brisbane Hospital, uh, the Queensland Institute of Medical Research, ourselves and the federal government. Um, and we're looking at whether we can build a classifier on whole genome data um, to work out, based on clinical trials, which immunotherapy your tumor is likely to respond to. Sounds easy, because we've, uh, we've all built classifiers. The problem with human genome is that it is 3.2 billion base pairs. Uh, one patient is 300 gig in compressed data. So our current working data set is 30 petabytes uh, issue. Um, so we've got about three years of funding. We're working through a range of problems. We're seeing a lot of early promise in what we consider traditional genomics problems. Um, you know, can we do ethnicity segmentation, which is, is traditionally done by calling certain genes and working out um, you know, very deterministically where you fit. We're seeing that ML can do those tasks better and faster. Um, which is extremely exciting. So we're hoping that we can build out a classifier that will help get the right treatment to the, the right patient. This is really, and this is where, you know, for me, before I hand over to Athen, this is where I get really excited. We, we've been involved in a, a whole lot of different things from smart cities to, to precision medicine um, to financial services. And what I, I think I've seen personally in the last 15 years in this industry is a massive increase in the collection of data. Um, whether it be through sensors or through you know, you know, big data programs or through um, genomics. But what, what, the reason why all of those programs have struggled to show value is that they don't have a decision making element to them. They collect a lot of data and the promise was people would be able to look at the data and find things out from the data. But really what we need in life is the ability from all that data to make decisions. Um, to make better decisions, to make smarter decisions, to make more precise decisions. And that's where AI fits across a lot of these industries, is the decision-making layer. Um, and, you know, it's a good example of precision medicine, but we're going to find that all across the spectrum, where with the data uh, architectures that have been put in place, we're going to be able to make better decisions, and that's when we're really going to see the value of these programs. Cool. So, well, uh, sorry, just before you go, what, uh, what time does this thing wrap up? Just. <laughs> <laughs> we usually try and head out the door about quarter past eight from memory. Uh, any odd beamers left in the room? You can confirm that time. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'll try and confirm oh, that well, we'll, uh, oh, well, you have, you have five, you have five minutes, minutes and then we'll, five do, minutes. we'll do QA, so show yeah. us the cool stuff. So Nick did me a favour there and gave the whole um, business premise for, I guess, reinforcement learning. So for those of you not familiar with RL, the basis is um, it's, it steals a lot from the animal reward system. Um, the idea of having an agent that is um, operating inside of some defined environment chooses from a set of possible actions or potentially a continuous space of actions, um, takes out those actions within the environment um, the observation space updates and a reward or some kind of penalty, one or the other, is received back. The agent updates their internal state in order to perform better next time round. Sorry, so, uh, 8.30, got a little bit more work right. than I thought. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Still five minutes. Yeah, five, yeah, yeah. Well, good call. Um, and we're sick of you. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so that's the businessy slide, so descriptive <laughs> ML later on. Um, descriptive analytics. So um, 
Yeah, the, the different strat, uh, types of analytics that you will see, you can be, first of all, what the hell happened there? Let's describe the problem uh, and in reflection. Further to that, you might be diagnosing um, why whatever happened, happened, and from there, trying to predict. The final step would be further to just predicting not only what will happen, but uh, how can we change the environment that we're operating in to uh, change what will happen. Excuse me, as so, a, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier because I can see people like frantically scribbling and taking photos, but yep. these slides are going to be available for us. Yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So you will see them on the meetup, so yeah. then hopefully just relax. And yes. <laughs> so in terms of uh, what you might see for models there, in order to do descriptive analytics, usually that'll be some kind of unsupervised model, uh, some clustering or some kind of visualization strategy like T, S and E, or um, using um, explainable supervised models. Uh, so Nick's just touched on explainability. So if you're building some uh, supervised model, you might want uh, a little bit better than um, some 80% recall rate or um, blind uh, test score. So there's uh, Lime and Shap, they're um, both uh, developments only, uh, I think Shap uh, only came out this year, Lime's a paper that's about one year old, so that's locally, uh, inter uh, locally integrable model agnostic explanations. So the cool thing about Lime is uh, you don't actually, uh, you, it'll, it'll work on um, nonlinear models, so uh, it allows for explanations on deep learning models but uh, it's still a long way from ideal. <coughs> Predictive analytics, um, so supervised models like we've been talking about all evening, and obviously the most valuable, but also the most challenging um, and uh, highly dependent on um, what's available, reinforcement learning uh, for prescriptive analytics. What, what do we do? Um, with the goal being to try and find an optimal policy within a simulated environment uh, in order to make decisions. So, uh, like I said, based on the reward hypothesis, uh, originally uh, came out of um, cognitive neuroscience and psychology. We've stolen this one from a blog, po a blog post by one of our other brilliant engineers. Um, again, the idea of reinforcement, negative reinforcement with the hope that um, said action won't occur again, or positive reinforcement to reward that. Um, so RL is just a computa computational way of learning through action. Um, so touched on this as well, one of the challenges with RL is the exploration versus exploitation problem. Uh, we as people encounter this every day. Um, if you are, are choosing where you're going to eat for lunch, you might have that favourite place that you've been to um, uh, 12 times in the last month or uh, there might be a new place that's open and you think, well, those look like great burritos, maybe I should try that. Um, we encounter this all the time and especially with RL, uh, the closer we get to reality, the more we see a huge action space, um, a huge environment and um, having a robust model for making these kind of decisions uh, is a big part of the challenge, and this has kind of been the, at the at the heart of um, work, uh, reinforcement learning uh, since the outset. Um, I thought I'd give an example of a group that's done really well at this uh, recently. So this is uh, OpenAI's probably second most recent work with um, with uh, OpenAI Five. Is I think they're probably fighting it out right now yeah. um, online somewhere. But uh, this, I actually thought this one was way, well, way cooler potentially because Bionics is just awesome. But this is uh, 24 degrees of freedom um, in a bionic hand. The brilliant thing about this is that uh, not uh, the the physical constants of the real world were simulated, but as also were 10,000 other universes where the physical constants are quite the same. So friction and gravity. There was a degree of uncertainty that was factored into simulations, including um, the shape and colour and, and 
uh, of, of the object. And after 100 years of training experience, you end up with a model that can actually perform the same operations robustly in the real world. So it's not just um, factoring in for variation within the data, it's factoring for variation within the mapping from a simulator to re uh, real space. And uh, this is a prime example of, of building powerful, robust models. But um, uh, at this stage, 100 years of training experience, um, we've, we've got a long way to go in terms of efficiency of our RL systems. Um, well, this is, the, this is some of the work we've done. So <laughs> that's interesting. Um, Working on Sonic uh, World Models, it's a David Hart paper, it's really cool, if you haven't read it, read the blog post. We um, took this design, applied it to um, uh, an OpenAI competition, love the work that OpenAI is doing. Um, some of the team at OpenAI very recently have um, uh, pulled out uh, this uh, competition with multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, we uh, thought that was really cool, so we are working on uh, developing our own solution for playing this game of Common Man. It's going to be a 2v2 multi-agent environment where we'll have uh, both cooperative and competitive agents. So uh, this is uh, ticking away on our GPUs right now. So uh, and, and we'll be we'll be presenting. Well, hopefully we'll be presenting some results at NIPS this year. So that's us. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, go, go ahead. I <laughs> <coughs> just want to regard to the first use cases where you have the location uh, as inaccurate uh, when the data comes in, if you ever consider just looking at the data, because obviously you want to make uh, the location as a thing is accurate, but you scale that. Normally, I think I saw that was uh, very uh, usually a major model in the uh, we do rotate. So, uh, for people who don't have a mic for the audience, uh, if you could maybe yeah. just yeah. summarize the question. That sure. Is so, the question was um, have, to in the initial example where there was some rotation of the um, the land use uh, photograph, whether we had just thought about rotating um, the land use on the way in, which we do do. Um, the problem is that because it's a flyover picture, it can be on any angle. So, we could rotate thousands of times to. Any angle, or we could just programmatically rotate to a, a particular, and we do rotate a bunch of different angles, but we want to get it to something that's, that's predictable. The, the bigger problem was cutting off the edges of the lots um, to make sure that the image that we got from the flyover didn't um, have a lot of noise from you know surrounding lots in it. Um, so rotating it to to be a you know a, a flat image was sort of a simple step, but the main problem was how do we cut out the noise from around the lot. How do you choose your major cloud partner? Yeah. Good question. So the question was, how do we choose our major cloud partner? Um, we don't have one. We work with all the cloud partners. So you have like IBM. We we work with IBM. We work with uh, Google. We work with Amazon. We work. No, we don't work with Azure. Um, <laughs> we do if our client insists yeah. on it. Um, that's because they don't have GPUs in Australia. So that's the point. Um, the 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 question: How do we choose our uh, cloud partner probably comes down to two things. A, how many compute credits are they willing to give us? Um, <laughs> two, what's their stock of GPUs in Sydney look like? Um, and three, do they actually have anything that's interesting? So this is where it does get different. Um, IBM are a partner of ours. We don't use their cloud environment. We use their HPC environment on Power 9. Um, they have some badass kit that is like six V100s with a terabyte of system memory and 128 cores in a single box with large model support that we can go into another day, um, that is seriously, seriously cool hardware um, and performs, I think their benchmarks are 47 times better than the equivalent kit. Um, so there is, there is differences, I mean when you talk about cloud partners, more or less we're talking about commodity hardware just sold for a you know, fraction of a cent on the hour or the second these days. Um, we don't care who's got the most credits. And I guess uh, the finally sort of time, time is back to the business discussion is you know we're agnostic. We work with the clients. So you know what we you know what we found is there are other organisations that come in and they've tailored to one. And so the first step for them is actually selling 
that cloud provider into the organization. And it's like if you're going to go you know, into a major bank or a major insurer and go, you know, this is why you need to use Google, this is why you need to use IBM, like you're kidding yourself. So whereas if you go in there and say, what do you use? And they go, oh, we use Microsoft or we use Amazon or we use Google. And you go, yeah, we can work with that. Happy days. The, the other thing I guess I'll add is that we don't like, um, we don't like cloud providers that try and build war gardens. Um, which is why we're a Kubernetes house. Um, deploy on Kubernetes and if Google offer more cloud credits next week, then we'll pick up our deployment, we'll drop it there. Um, the, I, I think that everyone should be encouraged to be as cloud native as possible. These guys are in um, a commodity space, right? They're selling commodities. Um, so we should not be beholden to their rules or their systems. We should be free agents that operate and take the best price we possibly can for what we need when we need it. Um, and to do that, you need to make sure that you are not locking yourselves in with services like AWS Lambda or AWS SageMaker or, sorry, AWS, any of your services. Um, architect on things that are open source and cloud native um, and, and cloud agnostic. And it will mean that if you do ever need to deploy on-prem, which is a reality in a lot of um, enterprises that don't have a cloud strategy or, or can't. If they do, they don't have an appetite to send their most sensitive data to the cloud, which means that the training of those models isn't going to go to the cloud, um, then you can deploy on-prem as well with the same confidence that you could in any cloud provider. So. I'm sorry, I'm missing values in mutation. You mentioned that it's only used at the training stage of the model, but do you not use it at the stage of testing but evaluation or the actual production? Would it not improve the performance of it? So we do validate on our imputation strategy. It's just that that validation is carried out before we finalize our models. Well, it was the way that that proof of concept played out. But uh, I think I addressed a, a similar question, which was, well, this is definitely, would this work better if that was integrated into the entire production pipeline? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So. Yeah. Um, just wondering if you have any other um, ideas um, in the medicine area besides the immunotherapy? Many. Um, no, there's a question, please. Oh, sorry. The question was: Do we have any other ideas for applications of machine learning in the medical sector? Um, I'll tell you a few stories. The people that I know that are doing things that are working. Um, the first is there's a team in Gold Coast run by um, a brilliant um, ED um, doctor who's currently the ED director at Gold Coast Hospital um, called IntelliHQ. They're building a massive um, streaming platform that predicts things like cardiac arrest on EDs um, and will give doctors heads up early on whether you know something is going to happen in the ED. Super, super interesting. Um, they've managed to convince GE and Philips, who are the two providers that you'll see in an ED of equipment to give up their data and to plug it into their platform. Um, they're doing inference in real time, which is super cool. The other example um, is an IBM example. Um, IBM research team in Melbourne have a lot of work on epilepsy. So they're using um, data to, to predict epileptic fits. Um, they can do so with up to four hours notice, which is a total game changer for someone with epilepsy, right? Um, if, if you have ep epilepsy in some countries, you can't hold a driver's license. It's the case in Australia. <coughs> because you don't know if you're going to have a seizure, right? Um, and therefore, you can't be trusted behind the wheel, which is a, a severe restriction on their mobility and their freedom of life. If they can have some heads up, even if it's a minute or two minutes, that can totally change their quality of life. Um, so that team are looking at a range of other applications of their tech. Um, if you have a look at the paper called GrassNet, that they released just recently. They're looking at brain-controlled bionic limbs for people with locked-in syndrome. Um, that's super hardcore and, and amazing. Uh, there's another startup in Queensland called Maxwell MRI, which are using machine learning to look at MRI data um, and and help uh, you know that phase of, of diagnosis and just make it easier and faster for that to happen and therefore cheaper. Um, our team are even looking at drilling data out of historical pathology reports. Um, using natural language processing to go back and look at historical pathology reports to um, help you know, do studies on mass without us having to re-read um, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of reports which are held in archives. So I think, I mean, I think the health space, honestly, there's 
almost limitless applications of machine learning um, technologies. It's about finding the right application, but really it's about finding the right stakeholders, right? The first example I gave you was a, an ED doctor and he has obviously access to the ED data. We've partnered up with a hospital um, and with a genomics institute that have data. Uh, the, the Maxwell MRI team came from, from a medical background. The biggest problem in medicine is data. It's only going to get harder as people sort of um, realize the, the power or the value of their, of their medical data and want to restrict access to that more. So really, you, you've got to find the right source of that data to, to actually get it. And, and the, other, the other problem that we're going to have, which is another interesting issue, is what, when we actually build these systems, will clinicians trust them? Yeah? Um, because it's all well and good to build a predictive immunotherapy, but if I give it to an oncologist and he or she thinks, nah, I don't really know how that works, so I'm just going to keep doing it the way that I do it, which is you know, the 10 patients I've seen in the last three years, um, that, that is a very real concern. Um, doctors take very seriously their, their responsibilities to their patients and aren't too eager to jump into new technologies. Um, so educating, it comes back to explainability, it comes back to trust that we build. Um, we definitely need to go on a journey with the medical professionals to make sure they trust in the systems that we're building to help manage their job better. Um, what's your big data tech stack like? Changes every day. Sorry, the question was, what's our big data tech stack? Um, it changes all the time. Is the honest answer. Uh, we tool for the problem. You know, tool for the problem. Uh, we're big Spark users. Um, we use tons of Spark. We use Presto. We use um, man. We we use. It changes every day. Um, I, I would say, you know, we jump between using Scala for big data workloads to. You know, Python for some things, obviously, machine learning is, is heavily Python. Um, we've, we've worked on data sets up to petabytes um, and down to 2,500 rows. So it might be Postgres all the way through to... A, a lot of it sometimes is dictated by your cloud strategy. Um, there, there are great products on particular clouds for big data applications. We've done a lot of experimentation lately with MapD. That's a um, GPU database company based out of San Francisco. Um, there, if you there's a there's a super geek on the internet that has a blog that benchmarks uh, uh, queries across a 1.1 billion row data set, the New York City taxi data set, across every data you know store that imaginable. Um, he's super cool, uh, and basically MapD can run that query in 0 0.004 seconds, whereas you know your fastest, you know, say Spark's like 16 seconds, um, it tuned to the absolute max. So. There's, there's a promise in GPU databases, but they're very fit for purpose. It depends on a whole lot of things. We use Elasticsearch. Um, yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you want to be, you don't want to, you don't want to bet down on, on any particular tech stack. Things change too quickly, um, and every problem for us is different. So we, we just try and take everything from first principles and choose the right tools for the job. So I think we have one back. Oh yeah. Uh, could you expand a bit uh, on the uh, event-based uh, predicting? Because you didn't, I mean, I'm curious about that. Yeah, I'll give that to Alan. That's it. All right. Uh, yeah, that's uh, for the uh, recommendation system. Oh, yeah. yeah, so that's um, a recurrent model. So uh, the idea is that um, you would learn sequences, events, sequences of events across a number of examples. Um, with the goal of um, predicting classifications that are relevant within the time frame. So uh, that's, uh, I think we ended up with a um, regular recurrent neural network. For a lot of our language work, we've used LSTMs and multiplicative LSTMs. But for the RNN, uh, we weren't really seeing customers with a purchase history of um, beyond maybe three figures. And so within those kind of time scales, an RNN, uh, a uh, classic RNN is probably more favorable. So uh, that was the event-based topology and um, we're, yeah, we're applying it throughout our work. Uh, yeah. On that, you were um, mentioning for your uh, profitability work, uh, how you sort of landed on gradient boosting stuff. Um, but how are you applying that with a problem which is presumably very kind of natural language oriented where you've got a kind of inherent sequential or convolution of what the nature of the data. How does that be can't even become like a traditional kind of linear regression problem? 
Well, the, the named entity recognition um, piece was obviously using LSTMs. Um, so there's a getting the data into that final frame. Um, and we looked at sequential models. We looked at the end, the I think it's a factor of a very, very small training set, right? We're talking at the end 2,500 cases that went in. So there's only so much training data there. Um, okay, so it wasn't really an aspect of like comparative language. It was more like everything can be feature engineered, therefore... Yeah, and, and the language was used very much in the feature engineering stage. So out of the 140 variables that ended up in the model, um, I think probably... Nearly half. Nearly half came out of natural language. Yeah. Um, and so we were looking at relationships and any uh, classic NER problems. Um, but that's sort of part and parcel of what our natural language team do. So they just built a custom NER model. But that was entirely restricted, restricted to uh, pre-processing. Yep. 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 Okay. yep, yep, yep. And then just put into the data frame, um, feature engineered, and, and then the XGBoost used to make the predictions. Yep. It had to be comparable with the structured data. So we, we needed to make use of that um, structured numerical data. Uh, Okay. Um, what do you find most time consuming in bringing in um, your deep learning models to production? <laughs> well, I get. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. The question was what do we find most time consuming bringing our deep learning models into production? Let's cut it in half. You can do experimentation, I can do production. Okay. Oh, well, for experimentation, I'll think, yeah, I'd say it's the same thing that's been most time consuming in this talk. Um, so the, all of the dealing with um, issues in data, either not enough of it or not enough breadth of it or just having to really need it to actually get the valuable information out of it and um, so yeah that's I guess a large part of what I talked about in our engineering process and uh, it's something that we encounter a lot and that was a particularly challenging one. Um, recently, we've kind of been pushing more for, for larger, cleaner data sets so that we can get straight into the um, engineering piece. But uh, yeah, I can do the production. Production. I don't. I, I guess I don't know what the, the longest piece is. But what you end up finding in production, there's a whole lot. There's a whole lot more questions to, to ask than just is the model performant. Um, you know, how quick does the inference time need to be? Does it need to be you know, under 100 milliseconds in the time of a standard REST API call? Or do we have the luxury of a second to make that inference? Um, what, what, you know, how parallel does it need to be? You know, do we, are we going to get hit with thousands of requests simultaneously or are we just going to be ticking over? Can we queue them? Um, there's a lot of classic software engineering problems that come into productionizing models. I think one of the biggest problems at the moment is that a model will be built by an ML engineer and handed to a DevOps engineer to productionize. And then that DevOps engineer will do, will basically look at the Python that the ML engineer wrote and went, this is garbage, um, and redo a bunch of it. Um, they might do some network pruning, they might drop it out of the, the you know, PyTorch that it was experimented in and try and put it into CAF2 or something that's more performant in production. Um, and what ends up happening is you end up with a model that the software engineer doesn't understand because he didn't understand in the first place, right? He's got the code and went, all right, I'll just get some prod. And then the ML engineer looks at the stuff that the, the software engineer has changed and goes, well, I don't really recognize this anymore. I don't know what the hell this thing is. Um, and then no one's got responsibility, right? Um, so you, you end up with this mismatch. And that's kind of where I was touching on with that. If you can get in your heads that if you are building for production to architect for production early, um, you're, gonna, you're not going to have a lot of those problems because um, a, a notebook is not sufficient to give to an engineer to say productionize um, because you will have all of those problems that I just described uh, and you'll end up with a model that no one in the organization understands. That's probably, the, that's probably not the most time consuming but I guess Google coined the term that machine learning is the highest, rate, highest interest rate credit card of technical debt. Um, and that is 100% true. If you don't treat it right, you end up with a with a beast. Um, so it won't it won't be the, the biggest time consuming thing when you put it into production, but it will be after. How long did you guys spend on those cases? I think Nerve was done in about 12 weeks, um, yep. top to bottom. Yep. Um, Brisbane City Council probably 
two to four weeks? Yeah, with a lot of ongoing maintenance. I think Brisbane City Council one was an interesting one because it was something that we whipped up quite quickly. Uh, and then when we started actually getting live uh, data for it, discovered those issues, went and spent a couple of weeks fixing it, and then kind of every time we get new data from them, like we, we received data from them that, you know, it might be like a five by five pixel image. And you're like, what is this? You know, and they're like, it's a lot. And you're like, which pixel is the lot? Um, so, you know, like there's things like that that you kind of have to manage, um, you know, along the way. So that one, yeah, it has been ongoing. And I guess the um, PC was about four weeks. We, we don't like a POC to last longer than 12 weeks. Um, it's a very oh. limit. 12 weeks, we find the sweet spot's about eight, six, eight weeks. Um, and if, if we think a program's going to take longer than that, then let's find a bite-sized chunk of it that we can do in six to eight weeks and then work out the other yeah. pieces around it. And I mean, the, the production side is obviously much longer, but also far more commercially sensitive, so it's hard for us to talk about it. Uh, you have mentioned that machine learning also applied to financial services uh, industries. So do you have any other cases regarding that uh, field? So. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have any that I am at liberty to talk about, but I can give an example of one if I was to use an industry that isn't financial services. Uh, so let's say hypothetically you have a uh, pharmaceutical company, and in that pharmaceutical company you have a lot of salespeople. And those salespeople will have um, a, a patch a certain area that they look after, and as a business you'll have a certain number of levers that you'll pull to control those salespeople. Say the cadence they contact their customers, the number of customers on their books, the, uh, the remuneration they're paid, the bonuses that they're paid, um, a, a whole lot of different things that you as a manager or, or, or an organisation can, can run. If you can A, work out across all of those different variables, how to optimize the performance of your salespeople. Um, but B, which is where we, we kind of want this program to go, use reinforcement learning to actually hypothesize the optimal set, the optimal policy environment for your salespeople to be operating in, then you should be able to get a lot more out of them than you currently are. So it's kind of replacing or augmenting the management layer of an organisation with machine learning, which is super interesting. We're seeing it a lot, obviously, in fraud detection, um, which is you know age old. Uh, there's a lot of manual paperwork that occurs in financial services that um, is slowly being automated. Um, in Australia, we have a fairly onerous responsible lending laws, um, which is which is meaning that banks are going to have to are spending a lot more time reading through customers transaction list to work out whether they can afford a particular financial product. So obviously automating that, understanding what the actual discretionary income that someone has is, what's their baseline spending, can they afford this loan, um, is, is definitely, a, you know, there's a lot of active work in that space. There's, I think in financial services there's a huge amount of, of opportunity. The last one that I've, that I've seen recently, um, that isn't our work, but, but there's a lot of work happening, is in um, policy sanitization. So lots of banks will have thousands of policies that have existed over a long time. They probably spent, no one, is anyone here from Deloitte? Um, you know, but they probably spent a lot of money on Deloitte and PwC and EY to over time do transformation projects to try and consolidate these things and most of those have failed. Um, so can you use ML to actually just understand the, the policy nature of the bank and anything that the bank's trying to do, so does it offend a particular policy that might be sitting in a back drawer somewhere. Um, so yeah, so compliance, regulatory compliance, compliance, we're seeing a lot of um, prediction, predictive algorithms on, you know, I think SMEs are an interesting space because they generally get no attention from bankers. Um, they don't fit into business bank accounts, they're not consumer bank accounts, they're kind of in this awkward middle space. But if you can understand what a growing business looks like and at what point it needs certain financial products, you can kind of give it the appearance of one-to-one -one attention at a critical phase um, without you actually having to build infrastructure to give it one-to-one -one attention. So if you know that business is at the point that it's likely to take out equipment finance or take out you know, small business lending, you can get a banker involved to take care of that, of that transaction. Moreover, you can then appear like you're supporting that business through its growth um, without it sort of being in that awkward phase that it just feels like the banks don't care about it. Um, mainly because they generally have very small lending and therefore don't mean a lot of money um, to financial services. So, 
a few examples, but there's a, actually a really awesome paper came out last week from the World Economic Forum um, that's about 100 slides long on, on how AI is going to impact banks worldwide. Um, it's got a lot of stuff from our friends at, at Royal Bank of Scotland and a range of others that are really pushing the frontier on this stuff. I, I definitely suggest you, you seek it out and give it a read. Why don't we take uh, one more question? Yep. You guys have been very generous uh, with your time. I bought us a, a little bit more breathing space, so we don't really have to sprint for the door after this question. Uh, but yeah, we better, better cut it off at some point. So. Last one. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're in a really interesting uh, position as a consultancy going into large organisations and effectively being in the position where you can pick up their tech stack. Now, contrary to that, I do perceive, obviously, big tech companies, we do kind of pick up these technology stacks and just run with them. Mm. From your perspective as consultants, do you think that's a hindrance to these organisations or what would your suggestions be perhaps on how they make an improvement internally? Yeah, can I re rephrase the question? Is it, are you asking the question that should businesses look to transform their existing um, tech stacks yeah, in order to take advantage yeah, of them? Yeah, exactly. How much advantage do you perceive is there based on your experience consulting with them and being across the room? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you that as a, as a consultant, the hardest thing is to get any major organisation to do anything with this technology ever. Um, and, and that's because that generally those things are, are very high risk at this stage. Um, I think, I don't know if it's the same in New Zealand, but Australia, we, like we've, I could count on one hand the number of successful major transformation projects I've seen in the last five years. Mo most transformation projects I've seen have been dismal failures. Um, so for us the question is how do we, how do we use machine learning you know, the, the spectre of machine learning and where we can get to to help them carve a critical path to a more modern infrastructure. Uh, I was working, touch back on financial services, I was working with a major financial services company in Australia um, and they were boasting about their big data environment. I'm like, oh, it sounds cool. You know, they're like, oh, I've got Hortonworks to do it, it's amazing, uh, it's the best. And I was kind of like, what, what, uh, what, what do you want to do with it? And they say, oh, we want to do, you know, we want to do real-time, um, you know, product recommendations. We want to do fraud detection. We want to do all this real-time stuff. I'm like, but it's what works. It's a hardware system. It's a batch system. And they're like, ah, oh, yeah, but it'll be fine. It's like, no, 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 it won't be fine. You bought, you know, you bought a, you bought a truck when you want to race on the on the track, right? You, you've got the wrong tool for the job. So. But the, the question for them isn't, well, let's rip out $100 million worth of hardware and start again. The question is, how do we show the executive that these technologies have got real business promise and they're going to create value for the business? And therefore, what, what is a minimum viable product for us to stand up a real-time analytics environment, um, event-driven environment that we can sort of roll this out to a segment of customers and then we can start investing money in it? Um, I, I think for, from my point of view, I find the appetite for businesses to wholesale change is somewhat less than it was five years ago. Um, and they're looking for that incremental phase, but they're looking to start with the value, to establish the business values there, and then let the tech follow, um, and not take really big bets on going all in. Most of my clients have multi-cloud strategies now. Um, they're not looking to invest necessarily in, in on-prem hardware anymore. Um, they're looking to be much more agile about the way they approach their tech stacks. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank Sorry. you again. Yeah, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. It's always good to have a room to be able to talk to. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that if anyone else has any other questions um, you know, and can't ask them tonight, just go to the website. You know, you'll find an inquiry line. Just put the subject as Auckland AI and send it away and we'll do the best we can to get back to you. But uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.